I love it when a game has me doing weird stuff to try and find secrets. That doesn't come around too often though. It's an itch that most games, even if they do have some sneaky hidden content, don't seem to scratch. And AAA games almost never achieve this, with ones like Baldur's Gate 3 being something of an exception, but even then it doesn't feel the same when you know dozens and dozens of people have made that possible. No, I love it when a game has me dumbfounded and it was made by a small team or even one person. Small indie games have such an esoteric quality to them that I absolutely adore. A few years back I had that with Oleander Gardens games, the Pagan Trilogy and the two Hexcraft games. The public at large has had this with series like Five Nights at Freddy's. I don't think people will like that I just mentioned these two things together, but it's true they're both packed with secrets. And I'm glad to say that most recently I've had that with Lunacid. But before I explain why it scratches that itch, let's talk about what it actually is. Lunacid was released fully on Halloween this year after being in early access for some time, and I don't know how, but I was almost completely unaware that this even existed until I was notified by somebody in my Discord. And that surprises me, as it was made by none other than Akuma Kira, the very talented game developer and musician behind Lost in Vivo and Spooky's Jumpscare Mansion. I've never actually played Spooky's Jumpscare Mansion, but I I've heard good things. And Lost in Vivo was one of the best indie horror games of the 2010s, so why did I miss this? Well, that's actually quite easy to explain. Twitter is fucked and I don't really use it anymore, but thanks to people far more informed than me, I was able to seek it out and play it, and good lord, am I thankful for that. I'll get one thing out of the way really quickly, and that is that this game is clearly inspired by Kingsfield and Shadow Tower, old games from the developer From Software, which has gained much more fame for their later projects, like Darkman's Bing. And much like Lost in Vivo was inspired by Silent Hill, the inspiration is clearly there and aspects of the game are lovingly recreated or reimagined, but that doesn't define what Lunacid is, nor does it place the value on that inspiration. I can say that safely because I adored this game and I've never touched a King's Field or Shadow Tower game. Lunacid more than holds up by itself. So yeah, it's a first person RPG where you go around killing things, exploring, solving environmental puzzles and whatnot. You don't need these other games to appreciate that. So let's talk about the story. Moon bug. Moon bug. Moon sick. Pit where people go when they're no longer not pit people. And that's all you're getting from me. The whole intro is wonderful. It has this incredibly nostalgic voiceover with some really cool transitions followed by a very typical scene of us having our hand cut off and pushed into a giant hole. I love it. And you know what? For the rest of the game, I'm pretty sure we only have one hand. That means if you pick up a shield, it's no longer a shield, it's a very wide hammer. I largely forgot about that aspect of the game though because our characters really don't seem to care a whole lot. They seemingly have no issue handling weapons that most people would struggle to swing with two hands, let alone one. Look at this. Do you know what this is? This is a Zweihander. Fuck the rules. In general, the whole weapon selection is wonderful. When it comes to RPG games, I'm the kind of guy who will usually pick Human Warrior on my first playthrough almost every single time. And there's a lot of games that make that the boring choice, despite the fact that there is nothing cooler than a guy with a club in a world where people can conjure demons and shit. The fact that this guy can compete without any gods or magics on his side is completely impeccable, and somehow that's the boring choice. Are you insane? If you were in any fantasy world, you would be terrified of this man. Go home, human warrior. You have no place among us angelic chosen ones, alien demon lords, and fantastical nature deities. Those are the last words of every fantasy character before fucking John Hammer bludgeons them all to death with some DIY tools. How is that? By default, not the best character in any fantasy setting. Oh, I, I want to be a super powerful wizard with lightning hands and ghoul familiars that can move mountains with my mind. Nah, I want to be the thing that scared you away into the nursing arms of magic. And even with those incomprehensible powers, you are still barely comparable to John Hammer, the man who will punch gods to death. What I mean to say is that Lunacid has some very fun melee choices for strength-based characters, which a lot of games don't. And one thing about the weapons that I really appreciate is that the game makes different damage types, for example, normal, light, dark, poison, fire, and so on, actually really important. Even in games like Dark Souls, which has tons of different damage kinds, if you use a Zweihander for the game, you'll do fine. In fact, you'll do better than most of the people who do use magic weapons. Enemy weaknesses and resistances are super important and made me actively approach different situations with different items. 
In a lot of games I'd find that a little annoying because I tend to find something I like and stick to it, but then again, there's some really nice variety that makes switching actually fun. One of my favourite aspects that some of the weapons in this game have is their ability to level up. There's not an upgrade system as such like you'd find in other games, but some weapons have an XP meter of their own that levels independently from you, and when it's full, you can bring it to the liquid, and it will upgrade to a new weapon for you. Some even have multiple layers of upgrades, and at least one weapon I found can be switched back and forth into different damage types depending on which one you need. But if you're a coward, there are other combat modes available, and I hate to say it, but they're also pretty fun. Usually dexterity is reserved for the weak younger siblings of strength weapons, but here it has the distinct and honourable purpose of keeping its cowardice strictly to ranged weapons and jumping. Holy shit, you can jump so high if you level dex, and that is a strangely important aspect of the game, but I'll talk about that more later. The ranged weapons are pretty cool. You've got crossbows, bows, and gun. Gun, musket, shoot the snails. Now, I can absolutely get behind a fantasy character annihilating demons and wizards with a fucking gun. That's very doom. There's also magic, which is frustratingly entertaining at times. There are damage and summoning spells, but those aren't the ones that appeal most to me. There are two spells in particular that really tickle me. The first is lithomancy. What does lithomancy do? Not a tremendous amount. Outside of giving inanimate objects sentience in such an abrupt and unnatural way that makes them simply shudder and scream. Why do we do this? No idea. The other spell is Rock Bridge. Now that's because the exploration in Lunacid is wonderful, and that's one of the areas where that mystery itch really gets scratched, and Saying it like that makes me consider speaking to a doctor, but when it comes to exploration, this game really does not hold your hand. And I mean that in a nice way. Generally, I hate it when somebody says that a game doesn't hold your hand, because the only time I've ever seen people say that is when a game has absurdly bullshit difficulty. Oh, finally, a game that doesn't cater to the snowflakes and hold your hand. And they're talking about, like, fear and hunger or something like that, which, by the way, does hold your hand. It just holds it so hard that it tears it clean off, then proceeds to slap you with the severed remains while you realize you've lost 50 minutes of non-progress. By the way, um, review of fear and hunger coming soon. But Lunacid really doesn't hold your hand meaning you just have to figure stuff out by yourself and not that it actively punishes you for playing it. The games I mentioned at the top of the video share that quality, and for some reason having a small development team behind that makes it so much more endearing. So many parts of this game are off the beaten track, and I adore that. Some of the highlights of my playthrough were discovering hidden walls or areas that are completely inaccessible by ordinary means. Spells like Rockbridge effectively let you fly. Very slowly, granted, but still, fly. And that's just one of the examples of ways to explore. Verticality plays a huge role in the game, and Rockbridge isn't the only way to maneuver that. Like I said, leveling decks makes you jump like a madman. It can allow you to skip huge sections of levels or reach weird little spots that may or may not serve any kind of purpose. But that's not the only route to finding secrets in this game. It seems like parts of the game are hidden behind your PC's internal clock, various items that I'm yet to find, and strange little actions that are far from normal, and I really like that. On my first playthrough, I came across several areas that didn't really seem to serve any kind of purpose, some of which were really quite out of the way, and it was only after I finished the game that I realized quite how much more content there was to explore. I'm aware that the game has been pretty widely dissected by its player base at this point, so I could go online and find out how to do certain things that I'm currently stumped on, but that doesn't really appeal to me. There's very little in gaming that feels as good as solving some obscure puzzle or finding some hidden thing that's beyond explanation. And I still haven't figured this thing out. What? Why is there a whole alphabet here? I can't wait to struggle immensely figuring it out. There's a real artistry to putting secrets in games. I worry that a lot of developers hide their secrets way too deep or way too unnaturally, meaning they'll likely never be found, and I think that's... Well, it's a symptom of a post-game theory world. Whereas in things like Lunacid, the mysteries come at you naturally, and they invite intrigue through their existence alone. Other games like Pagan do this by basically being one big mystery in themselves, but managing to weave that kind of thing into an otherwise normal game is very impressive. All of the From Software games I've played have done this as well, and if Kiro's trying to mimic that aspect of those games, they did a great job. It's not an easy thing to do. Something that is easy to do, on the other hand, is misuse aesthetics. The indie horror space has had a huge trend over the last few years of using PSX or pixelated or otherwise retro aesthetics, and for a while, it was very cool. I liked it a lot. But now when I see it, I just wonder... 
why? With developers like Puppet Combo or Oleander Garden, you've got good reasons to use this aesthetic. They're actually basing their games on the premise of being retro. In Puppet Combo's case, they're going for the whole 70s, 80s B-movie thing, and the VHS aesthetic works well for that. For Oleander Garden, Pagan Autogeny is based on a 90s MMO, so the low-poly models and 4x3 aspect ratio work. There are others that go for, like, a Resident Evil or Silent Hill thing, and it's great to use, for example, tank controls and low-poly models there, too. And of course, the list for good reasons to use this goes on for quite a while. But then, there are hundreds, if not thousands of other games that use a pixel or VHS filter or are intentionally using low-poly models for seemingly no reason other than its popularity. And when that happens, it weakens not only the game itself, but the entirety of the genre. People already view the horror genre as a gimmicky hellhole of constant reiteration, and this certainly isn't helping. People are doing what Bloober Team did to psychological horror, but to retro horror. Please stop. Aesthetics matter. They, they mean something. But I am happy to announce that Lunacid does not do this. It has a good reason to use these retro aesthetics. You probably could have guessed that, but I just wanted to rant a little bit. This genuinely looks like an old RPG. When I launched the game for the first time, I played for a solid 20 minutes on a substantially lower resolution than I could have because I didn't even question why the game looked like that. It just felt natural. And the enemy designs in particular are spectacular. Kira has made very cool enemies in the past, and this trend continues here. The enemies here are one of the reasons I'd consider this game to be the perfect horror adjacent game. It's up there with others like the Souls games, The Binding of Isaac, Stalker, where the gameplay is isn't your typical horror formula, but when you start to look at shit, you're like, yeah, that's that's kind of fucked up. You've got your surface level fucked up, like Rat Kings, which are just a tragic thing that actually exists. Good lord. But then there's some really unique ones. For example, we all love a skeleton. They're the textbook enemy in any kind of fantasy setting. They're great. But bones are not the scariest part of a person. They're pretty benign things, all things considered. Let me show you Lunacid's mummy enemies. These guys have huge holes in their faces and stumble around with little more than instinct holding them up. They're like zombies, in a sense, and that's fine. Until you find a note that says, The brain was removed, but the wounds were inflicted within the skull itself. Who knows what that could mean? And then later on, you reach the library area, and you find these guys called the Enlightened Ones. Nervous systems that clawed their way out of the flesh to, I don't know, uh, to sort of float around. For the longest time, I wished that somebody would make the skeleton scarier cousin the wandering nervous system, and here we are. And it's horrible. I love it. Now I just want to see one that's constantly screaming in pain like these pots that I'm currently torturing. The other enemies in the game are fantastic too. Floating Necronomicons, weird blood-eating bug fellas, slimes, both friendly and not, and various lizard folk. There's also big snails, and they just rule. That's such a fantasy thing to do. Pick a creature on the roulette wheel of nature and turn it into fodder enemies. Fantastic. In terms of the game's other horror-adjacent aspects, the atmosphere is certainly spooky. Not scary, but definitely unsettling. Again, using the retro aesthetics and mechanics gives it a certain uncanny quality at times, as well as what I can only describe as a full emptiness in some of the larger areas. It's a comfortably ominous experience, familiar and distant at the same time. Few games I've played recently have such character and depth to their atmospheres as this does, and it's really quite special. That is, of course, aided by the music. Holy shit, the music in this game is so good. Here's some behind-the-scenes stuff for you. I work from home, and I spend a lot of time doing very monotonous stuff on my PC, so I'll just throw on Lunacid's OST to fill the void. It's wonderful. I'll either listen to that or the, um... The music from that part where you get sued in FNAF 6 for one hour. That one's also, that, that's pretty good. There are a few different artists behind the game's music, each with their own very distinct identity. Jaren Christ comes in with a mix of wonderful retro fantasy mixed with some kind of tasteful drums. Akuma Kira comes in with some very Silent Hill-like music that's genuinely haunting at times. And then Thor High Heels comes in with some genuinely incredible stuff that lays somewhere between the Norwood Suite soundtrack and the more peaceful parts of Deus Ex. As you can probably tell, I really have very little bad to say about this game. Lunacid is wonderful. I suggest you go and play it if any part of what I've described has appealed to you. 2023 has been a pretty great year for games, and this is certainly up there as one of my favorites. I think it serves another purpose too. I would say that it's at, or nearing, 
the limit of scope that a single developer should attempt. The fact that one person made the majority of this is wild to me. A lot of game devs out there try to make something way too big or ambitious, and that's how you end up with games that feel unfinished or never actually make it to release. So yeah, I'd say Lunacid is the absolute gold standard for what's doable unless you are tremendously experienced or have other people helping you. Kira has done it yet again, and that's just about everything. Although, if you were approaching this game from the perspective of a From Software fan, you might like the current livestream series I'm doing where I play through Dark Souls with an enemy randomizer that the chat gets to meddle with. It's created two very passionate factions over on my Discord, and I'm all for it. You can catch me there at twitch.tv forward slash paintacus. I'll be streaming either that or some other stuff, usually some scary things, on Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. Other than that, you can support the channel on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash paintacus, like these fine people have. Thank you to all of them, and especially those on the $10 tier, Ernst the Ace, Untrusted Life, and the original Tex-Mex. And with that, I say... Bye. Next video should be up in a couple of weeks, but until then, well, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all again soon.